the word. Let's turn in our Bibles together to 2 Samuel chapter 12, where we're taking verses 1 to 15 as our text. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 15. God's holy word. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There are two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup, and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this thing deserves to die. And he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel. And it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why why do you despise the word of the Lord by doing evil in his eyes? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, Because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. The reading of Holy Scripture. Please be seated as we pray together. We're thankful for your word, O Lord, and we're thankful for your Holy Spirit. We confess our need for your spirit. We are a needy people, needy in many respects. As regards your word, O Lord, we need the Spirit's illumination. We need his ministry in our souls that we might understand all that you've given us in your holy revelation. So minister to us now by the Spirit himself as he abides in us. Open our eyes. Give us ears to hear. Illumine the pages of Scripture to our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
In 2 Samuel 11, it's David who dominates. David is the architect of all of the sinful activities that fill that chapter. David totally controls the action from the palace roof to the spot where Uriah was pierced through by the Ammonite arrows and died. Until that is, he crashes in to the unyielding standard of the Lord's judgment. As we read in that final phrase in chapter 11, the thing that David did was evil in the eyes of the Lord. In 2 Samuel 12, the Lord and his word dominate. We expect retribution. We expect judgment, and there is that. But we travel beyond the realm of judgment in 2 Samuel 12 into the realm of grace. We're going to look at this chapter from that perspective tonight under the theme of grace, greater grace than all our sin. The pursuit of grace, the wisdom of grace, the outrage of grace, and the wonder of grace. The pursuit, the wisdom, the outrage, and the wonder of grace. First, we observe the pursuit of grace in God's gracious pursuit in, of David and sending Nathan to him. The first word of the Hebrew text in chapter 12 is sent. And that's a signal. In chapter 12, that word occurs 12 times. Where everyone sends, David sends, Bathsheba sends, Joab sends, but it's primarily David who sends with disastrous results. He sent Joab to, to lead Israel's army in, uh, in the king's place, chapter 11 and verse 1. He sent and inquired about the beautiful woman that he saw bathing. Verse 3, he sent messengers uh, to Bring her to himself, verse 4, he commanded Joab, send to me Uriah the Hittite in a scheme to get Uriah, uh, Uriah to go down to his house. And he sent a letter by Joab's own hand, ordering Uriah, or by Uriah's own hand, ordering Uriah's death in battle, verse 14. And then finally, when all of his sinful deeds were accomplished, he sent for Bathsheba and brought her into his house as his wife. So much for David's sending. In chapter 12, it's the Lord. Chapter 12, it's the Lord who sends the prophet with this divine revelation of convicting truth. It's important to realize that God's sending of Nathan was an act of amazing grace. Whatever else it was, it was an act of amazing grace because without this act, without these opening words, without this gracious sending of Nathan, David was in for a bleakless, uh, a bleak rather, and hopeless aftermath of the dreadful mess of sin that he was entangled in. And what do these opening words of chapter 12 signal? They show us that divine grace pursues and exposes the sinner in his sin. They teach us that the Lord will not allow his servant, his true servant, to remain comfortable in sin, but will ruthlessly expose that sin lest he remain in it. 
You may succeed in unfaithfulness for a time, but the signal that this opening word, this opening action of first, uh, 2 Samuel 12 sends is that the Lord will come after you. This is the exceeding abundance of divine grace, the grace that pursues the sinner. He pursued us, each one of us in our sin, didn't he? He came after us. We were stubbornly stuck in that sin. And he came after us. And he saved us. And every time since then, when we have remained stubborn in our sinfulness, he has relentlessly pursued us and brought us back. That is greater grace in all of our sin. Secondly, the wisdom of grace. We see the wisdom of grace in Nathan's gracious confrontation with David. Now keep in mind, David was the supreme judge of the land. Nathan related a judicial case to him, and it stirred David's judicial sensibilities. Maybe David took this as an actual case uh, that Nathan had gotten wind of and was presenting it to the king as something, uh, as a, a legal brief. We don't know. But the case that he set before David is a fascinating one. After the two men are introduced in verse 1, they're described in verses 2 and 3, and then the rich man's deed is told in verse 4. The description of the two men is interesting. In describing what each man had, one line suffices for the rich man, and is much, verse 2, while four times as much a space is utilized to tell about the poor man's little, verse 3. Although the poor man had little, as Nathan recounts this story to David, he had a family. He had the warmth of a home life. But the rich man had a guest, and guests must be fed, yet the rich man couldn't bring himself to diminish his massive flocks and herds by a single lamb. And so he took the poor man's beloved, Lamb, just as he'd taken Bathsheba to prepare and feed his guest. David, having heard this case, was furious. His anger burned greatly at the rich man's actions. His response of verses 6 and 7 was both religious and judicial. He uttered an oath, as the Lord lives. He declared that the man who did it deserved to die and must meet the judicial law's requirement of fourfold restitution. But the supreme judge of the land saw more than a mere property offense here. There was a heartlessness, an abject cruelty. The one who had done this had no compassion. David related. A convincing case has been made that Nathan's story, this case that he presented to David, is the hinge. It's the, the, the turning point in the whole narrative of 2 Samuel 11 and, and 12. But of greater interest for our purpose is Nathan's gracious method in 
speaking to David. He understood that a full frontal assault, a direct confrontation would likely neither be effective nor productive. And so it's instead of rushing in with an accusation that might uh, have easily aroused David's well-prepared defenses, he began with a story. Instead of sitting down with David and calling the king a filthy womanizer and a cruel murderer, he began with, O king, let me relate to you this case, this situation. It was an ingenious strategy. A strategy that essentially finessed David into judging himself. Someone has characterized it well. It said, Nathan's sword was within an inch of David's conscience before David even knew that David had a sword. But it was more than Nathan, wasn't it? The Lord sent Nathan. This was the spirit of the Lord. This was the spirit of God working in the Lord's prophet. The ingenuity of divine grace is at play in this account, a grace that goes around our resistance and causes us to switch the floodlights on our own darkness. The serpent, it turns out, isn't the only one who's crafty. This is the holy craftiness of divine grace. When God determines to bring you under conviction of your sin and back to repentance, what chance do you have against grace like that? This is the wisdom of divine grace, greater grace than all of our sin. Thirdly, we see in these first 15 verses of 2 Samuel 12, the outrage of grace. The fury of David's judicial sentence provided Nathan with just the opportunity he sought. And the prophet wasted no time in exploiting it, declaring to the king, you are the man. Nathan's judgment speech, which is the Lord's judgment speech, remember, breaks down into three segments. Grace, verses 7 and 8, accusation, verse 9, retribution, verses 10 to 12. Now the Lord begins with grace. For sin to appear as sinful as it ought to appear, it must be seen against the backdrop of divine grace. So the Lord itemizes his grace to David in verses 7 and 8. Notice the emphasis of the eyes of Verses 7 and 8. It's I who anointed you as king over Israel. It's I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and you care. I gave you your, the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to these many more things. In this way, the Lord stresses the senselessness of David's sins against the backdrop of the lavishness of his grace to David. He really was the rich man. He had no need to take another man's wife or another man's life. The Lord was essentially saying to David, what haven't I given you? What did you lack? I would have given you more. 
The Lord could make the same speech to each one of us. The Lord could list before us the lavishness of his grace to us, not merely in our salvation, but in every facet of our lives. It would be a long list against which our sin, our disobedience would be measured. Verse 9 specifies the Lord's accusation of sin against David, and with a particular emphasis, the Hebrew text places special stress on the direct objects by placing them before the verbs. Uriah the Hittite you struck down with a sword. His wife you took as your own wife, but him you killed with the sword of the sons of Adam. Ammon. In this way, uh, the text emphasizes that David not only committed iniquity, but destroyed persons. He sinned against the Lord, and he sinned against the Lord's people. David would later write Psalm 51, which by the title of the psalm, which I believe to inspire, indicates that this was written concerning his sin against Bathsheba, Against you, you only, I have sinned and have done what is evil in your sight. But that doesn't negate the destruction that David's sin left in its wake of the lives, especially of Bathsheba and Uriah. And in view of all of this, Verses 10 to 12 announce the judgment. For the sword against Uriah, the sword shall never depart from your house. Verse 10, because David took Uriah, the Hittite's wife, uh, the Lord would take David's wives before his eyes and give them to his companions whose sexcapades would be as public as David's were secret. Verses 11 and 12. The trouble of David's house is the primary theme of 2 Samuel 13 through 20. We can't understand the extent of the Lord's judgment unless we catch a view of the way the Lord looked at David's sin. That view is expressed by the double use of the verb to despise in verses 9 and 10. Why have you despised? The word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight. Verse 9. By his adultery, Uriah, uh, David had, uh, had despised the Lord's commandment, had despised the Lord's word, treating the Lord's word as though it didn't matter. To despise the Lord's word, however, is to despise the one who gave that word. To trample on the commandment is to trample on the commander. Therefore, in verse 10, he declares, you have despised me. When we despise the word of the Lord, when we treat his word as though it doesn't matter, we're despising the Lord. The gracious God who sent Nathan and endowed him with the wisdom of grace to steer David to judge himself is the great judge of all the earth who was outraged because his servant had despised him. And part of God's grace to us, part of his grace in the lives of each and every saint is informing us of this outrage. It's a grace that teaches our hearts to fear. If it weren't for this outrage, if it weren't for the revelation of God's outrage against sin, we would never see its sinfulness. And we would never flee to Christ for salvation. 
This is the outrage of grace, greater grace than all our sin. Lastly, we see the wonder of grace. The law tells us what David deserved as an adulterer. He deserved death. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, Leviticus 20.10 says, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. But grace shows us what David received. Forgiveness and the commuting of that death sentence. Now the reader might be tempted to think that David got off easy. But to do so would only be to condemn himself since every sin deserves the wrath and curse of God in this life and the life to come. We do better to immerse ourselves in the grace of the text. First note, David's confession. Verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. What marks that confession? It's simplicity. I have sinned against the Lord. Only two words in the Hebrew. It's the simplicity of that confession that makes it so commendable. Just as in the case of the tax gatherer in Luke's gospel, who said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. So is the simplicity of David's confession here. There's no blaming others, as Saul did. No pleading that he had obeyed God and his commands in other respects. No equivocation, no excuses. David stands in contrast to Saul in that he was sensitive to divine critique. And it's a wondrous thing. It ought to make us stop and wonder at God's grace. Because this was the man's after God's own, this was the man after God's own heart. And it turns out to be a man after God's own heart is not to be perfectly sinless. But among other things, it's to be sensitive to the divine critique of our sins to be utterly submissive to God's accusing word. Secondly, consider the Lord's assurance to David. The Lord himself has taken away your sin. You will not die. Verse 13. There's no reason for that statement. It wasn't what the law called called for in in this case. The law called for death. And yet that's what David hears from a gracious Lord. I think sometimes we lose the sense of wonder over our forgiveness of sin. We confess our sins in public worship We hear of the assurance of pardon. That pardon is announced, but I fear too often it doesn't truly register in our hearts what a marvel it is that God promises to forgive repentant sinners. Sinners that have been forgiven again and again and again and sin again. He forgives. He covers that sin. He brings it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It ought to bring about a great wonder in our souls. What kind of God does that? What kind of God forgives the filthiness of our sins, sins that are infinite in magnitude. 
every one of them, no, no matter how small in our eyes, infinite in God's eyes because he's an infinitely holy God. Micah's prophecy captures well what our response ought to be every time we encounter the promises of God's forgiveness. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity, passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Having a God who does that should make our souls shudder with wondrous joy. Thirdly, note David's substitute. Verse 14 reads, however, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child that is born to you shall surely die. The Lord forgives the guilt of sin, but he inflicts the consequences of sin. He cleanses sin's defilements, but he may continue sin's discipline. For David, the Lord's forgiveness was both marvelous and costly. The child would die. It's as if the child would die in David's place. There was no doubt that David was under the threat of death. David himself had, had judged that the rich man deserved to die. Yet the Lord had spoken this word through Nathan, you shall not die, but instead the child that is born to you shall die. It's as if the child is David's substitute. Of course, David wasn't saved by that substitution in his place. This son merely died as a temporal judgment upon David. But the wonder of grace, greater grace than all of our sin, decreed that there would be another sending. David was saved by a substitutionary death of another offspring, David's greater son, Jesus Christ whom the Father sent to suffer and die to bear David's sins along with all other sinners who would look to him in faith. And if we're tempted in any way to think that God was severe in requiring the death of David's son through Bathsheba, we only need to remember that the son who died for David's and our sins was not only David's son, but God's only begotten son. Isaiah declares that God's one and only son, his beloved son, the son of his favor, with whom he was well pleased, was pierced through for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. By his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall. On him. That's the wonder of God's grace.
greater grace than all of our sin. Father, we humble ourselves before a gracious creator and redeemer who is more gracious than we can possibly even comprehend. It's what Paul uh, caused Paul to doxologize at the end of that passage that you penned, O Lord, through your Spirit, all the riches of the grace and wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. How unsearchable are your judgments. How unfathomable are your ways. We pray, O God, that you would show us the greatness of grace. That you would enlarge our hearts. That you'd expand our souls to take in the comprehensiveness of the grace that you have displayed. The grace that you have carried out. The grace that you've lavished upon your elect people through the suffering and death of your only begotten Son, even our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.